Welcome to this week in Missouri politics. The leftovers are over, the hunters are back to bow season, and we're back to business as usual. And we are very honored to have former Governor Jay Nixon joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you. I want to start off with a lot of people wonder exactly what you're up to now. Well, first of all, it was great to be governor. I appreciate that time. It's also been great not to be in the public eye as much <laughs> in that sense. Um, I'm practicing law with Dowd Bennett, great firm. We're primarily a defense firm, but we do a lot of work around the country. Uh, I've been working in a number of things in that area, mergers and acquisitions and some appellate issues and things of that, and really enjoying it. Uh, I can walk home to work. We live in University City, so it's <laughs> nice. I get to put a backpack on and go to work. I feel like a college student some days. Uh, and we're, we're beginning to get active uh, locally, only in a supportive role. So it was a really great honor for us at the Missouri Times to be able to spend a few hours with you and kind of talk about your whole career. And everybody that's interested now, you can see that, that, that collection of interviews, the first series is up right now at the end of this program. Uh, and one of the things that was so interesting to me going into it was, now that you've had a year to get some perspective, walk to work with a backpack a little without some higher patrolmen following you. Uh, what are some of the things you're most proud of looking back? Well, perspective is important. I, mean, I wrote every morning when I was governor. I kept a journal. So I've got that. I'm reading those. And it's, uh, I, I, want to say, I wasn't as, as, how shall we say, as favorable to fellow politicians in my own morning <laughs> writings as I try. I mean, it felt like sometimes I exercise my, uh, my, my uh, demons. But the things I'm most proud of, I mean, we had a very difficult fiscal situation. We came in and we dealt with it. Uh, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. We didn't raise taxes. We didn't borrow money. Uh, we made the cuts that were necessary. I appreciate the help folks were, but we had over 5,000 fewer employees were there, kept that AAA credit rating when eight states lost it. Uh, and by the time we were done on the fiscal side, we had less bond indebtedness, even though we were building the Fulton Hospital, even though we were helping higher education. So the fiscal part of keeping the, the, the ship of state there, making the necessary cuts, making government more efficient, we had to do some things that weren't popular, but we got them done. Real proud of that. Also very, very proud of some of the outdoor things we were able to do. Uh, as well as mental health. I mean, in the mental health, I think we fundamentally shifted and changed a lot of both how treatment is provided and the quality of that treatment in the future. You know, we get to base some of our conversation on that first state of the state. You laid out five things. One, you came in during the Great Recession of 2009. Jobs were plummeting. How do you feel like you did on jobs? Well, we, the unemployment rate is almost 10 percent when they're 4.4 percent. But I, uh, I'm always reminded of that John Maynard Keynes statement in which he says, uh, when the unemployment rate is 1%, that means in 1% of the households, the unemployment rate is 100%. <laughs> so the bottom line is, as governor, you, you're never yeah. done. Uh, okay, I'm proud of the progress we made, especially in the auto industry, especially in education. I believe education is the best economic development tool we are. We upped the number of four-year college graduates by 36%, up the number of A-plus recipients by 44%. You, those are real important on the economic second side. Second thing, one of, the, one of the parts of those five, we said you want to keep tuition down. Looks like you, that was one thing that you did, maybe having to drag some of the college presidents with you. Um, you know, the, you can use whatever verb or <laughs> adverb you want to use, but the record speaks for itself. No, they were very helpful. I, I think the things, we're very proud that we were number one in the country, keeping tuition rates down at our public four year institutions, but equally proud we improved the quality. We redesigned courses, we made transferability better. I thank the legislature for the help on that. Uh, did some reverse transfer things there. We, we were able to get the innovation campus started. We we're able to do a lot of things inside there. Former uh, Representative and Senator Pierce was, was helpful on some of the things that we had to get done to make, make sure that hours got transferred uh, and, and, and some of the mechanics in there. But I, I'm, I'm real proud of the work we did. Third in thing was you mentioned stay in the space. You uh, promised you'd keep the budget balanced without new taxes. The record, you got that account? Yeah, well, I mean, actually we cut taxes a few times. I mean, we took, got rid of that franchise Ooh. tax, which I felt was a double taxation on small businesses. We phased that out. We got rid of the tax on military pensions um, in our state. I, it, it's, and once again, moved that on out. So we not only held the line on tax, which you said, which surprised a number of people. Everybody kept thinking that, that uh, uh, you know, a Democrat's answer to a fiscal problem is to go put their hand in somebody's <laughs> pocket. But I think being from Jefferson County, I realized that uh, uh, it was not our job once we're elected to take our hands and take more money out of Missouri's pocket, it was our job to build an economy that could deliver the services with growth. You talked about health care. Uh, more people are covered, maybe not as many as at, towards the end you might have liked, though, right? Yeah, 140,000 kids especially. That was real important to us. We just took what authority we had and put the all, all so express, we call express lane, all sorts of ways to make sure those kids are covered. Certainly wish we would have drawn down those Medicaid dollars, would have been able to preserve some rural hospitals, would have been able to do much more. Uh, that was just in the politics at the time, very difficult to do. I also think on the mental health side, whether it's the autism, uh, mm -hmm. the 
the waiting list for developmental disability services down to zero for the first time. It was seven years when I was elected. I consider those kind of health care issues too. Mental health is health care to me. Um, and, and I think that we did some, some dramatic things for coverage. Also glad we got that spend down bill uh, that, that uh, Senator Representative Engler passed uh, so mm -hmm. to make sure that folks didn't have to completely impoverish themselves if they were in a difficult disabled situation. So we did some things, but overall it would have been easier with the, with the tax dollars Missourians pay to D.C. if we were able to use those to get some reform forms and improvements in our Medicaid system. The fifth thing was ethics. You talked about different types of ethics reforms. Instead of, instead of relitigating it all, what's the ethics system they should have to fund campaigns in the state of Missouri? Well, on ethics, I think one of the things that folks forget, but I'm real proud of, is getting the license fee offices and turning those away from political patronage and back into, you know, bidding them out. But that's a small step. Mm -hmm. It's just something that you can do in the, in the executive branch. Uh, but I, until we come to grips with the fact uh, that there's too much dark money in politics, uh, we're going to continue to breed cynicism by the public. Um, we passed contribution limits in Missouri. Uh, I argued that case at the U.S. Supreme Court and held those limits. Uh, Judge Rehnquist voting on our side. And I think, and I understand, I mean, I've raised $50 million. I understand the, the, the challenges out there. But I do think that especially the candidate committees reporting it and getting limits back in that zone uh, is, is important. You're the former governor. I'm just a simple hillbilly from West Butler County. I'm getting it, ready for a hard question here. Okay, go ahead. Well, it looked like a perception issue if you didn't like what the legislature was doing until the dark money. I think that all sides could agree that dark money, I don't know how you justify that. It's really hard to, because especially when, when, if you look back historically, and that's the other advantage you have being where I am, you can kind of look at this historically. Uh, when the legislature got rid of limits, uh, they said that the, the reason they did that uh, was to have transparency, was that contributions mm -hmm. should be reported more quickly. Remember, they had the 48-hour requirement, and the 24-hour requirement in certain periods and all that sort of stuff. And then just throw that out uh, later on and say that, that the dark money. System served Missouri pretty well. Uh, you got I, I, more votes than anybody in the history of the state of Missouri for governor under that system. Yeah, I, I think it did, and you got to raise money. I, you know, I'm yeah. not. Uh, I understand it. And plus, independent expenditures are fine. If, if if a group wants to make expenditures, if if somebody wants to put a neon sign up in their front yard saying Nixon's a bad governor, whatever, they can do that. It's an independent expenditure. I'm not talking about controlling that sort of activity, but I do think candidate committees and the actual campaigns and the money that touches and is used by candidates and office holders ought to be reported and known what it is. Let's talk about the. the Speaking of politics, the tone of national politics has changed dramatically from, you know, a year ago when you were in office. What's your thought on the, the change radically from really all levels of the political discourse? Um, it's, it's, I'm concerned by it. It doesn't appear overly thoughtful to me. And I'm just stunned at how partisan it is. I mean, there's good people that get elected to Congress and the Senate. I know a bunch of them. And it, it always has surprised me how, how if you go to, to go to D.C., just things just become uh, hyper-partisan. And, and so it, that concerns me. Um, obviously, I, I think the president is, is, uh, doesn't show the discipline necessary for the position uh, or, or the respect. I, I mean, I think that you should try to bring people together and not continue to divide them. And it appears that he's continuing the same strategy he had to get elected, which is fine for him, but I don't think it's best for our country. Um, and I, I'm concerned about where we slip worldwide. Uh, because if people don't trust us or they're in a meeting with the president and they think he might come out and tweet about him or something like that, it's really hard to get the information you need. I think one of the things people say about me is I told the truth. I also, if somebody wanted to have a serious discussion with me about some, where we were going, uh, I didn't turn around and, and uh, call you up uh, after the meeting, you know, in that yeah. sense. Uh, and I think that he's losing a little. Some of the, some of the other world leaders are, are, have, some, uh, have some challenges with that, and that could be a problem. Speaking of, let's talk about a couple of issues that are in the landscape today. One thing you weren't able to address was transportation. Right. What does the state need to do, in your opinion, to actually address the transportation needs? The well, waste, fraud, and abuse three-step yeah. is not reality. No. I mean, we tried eight different times to do something. I mean, whether it's toll roads for trucks or our, our bonding, all, all various things. But ultimately, um, it, with the seventh largest road system in the country and the 48th lowest income stream to pay for it, uh, we're either going to have to put more money in it real money, yeah. uh, and nobody gives away concrete and steel. you, you got to sure. pay for it, and Missourians are willing to pay for it, uh, in my opinion. I, I was there when we passed, uh, when Ashcroft was governor, sure. we passed the 222 plan. Uh, I didn't like the sales tax plan that was, was, was on the ballot when I was governor because I think that, that truckers and others should have to pay. I think a user fee is the best thing for roads. I think that uh, that's a fair system. So I, the bottom line is uh, folks need to come together and put in front, of the, in front of the public an opportunity to raise enough money to make a difference. You made a lot of appointments to boards and commissions. Those are obviously the issue of the day. Two questions. Did you, when you were appointing people, 
were they taking orders from you or do you think it was an independent board? And two, if they're going to take orders, should there not just be a secretary of education or finance or whatever that just reports to the governor? Well, the way the system's designed, I mean, board members aren't taking command and control from the governor's office. If you try to do that, it, it just it kind of cover it would would cover you up with time. You try to appoint good people. I worked through the leaders of organizations. Whether if it was Desi, we were dealing with the commissioner. We told the board obviously to uh, to do what's best for the state, and we want we want to improve education. But as far as command and control through boards, it's a very uh, clunky way to to. to to execute policy, even if you did want, if you wanted to, um, and some of the boards, uh, you know, like this here, the board of curators have long terms, have staggered terms, and that's meant to slow down, I think, a little bit um, some of the day-to-day -day politics and day-to-day -day decisions, and give them a longer view. Governor Nixon, you, uh, state senator, attorney general, one of only three Missourians in a hundred years to get two consecutive terms elected governor. Give me a piece of advice to somebody that in ten weeks is going to go to the Kirkpatrick Building and file for office for the first time. What, what, what would you tell that person starting I, uh, that journey? A couple things. One, be far something. Come up there for a reason, not just for your ego, but want to do something for the people you're going to ask to vote for. When I ran for the state senate, it was on our fair share. We needed a highways built, 21, which got built. We needed a foundation for them. You shifted a little bit to help us. Uh, Jefferson County was seen as kind of a secondary in, in the region, um, and I had some concrete ideas. I, the, uh, one of the ideas was to make sure we got rid of the, the penalty if, if an elder couple, one of them had to go into nursing care. They, oftentimes, they have to get divorced in order to qualify for the, for the benefits. We got rid of that in my first year with a bill I passed. So the bottom line is have something that, that, that's, that's, that you want to do, okay? Um, and then learn to listen. Because <laughs> people who run for office are good at talking, uh, but listening is what gets the, the, the when you are finding the, the connections to actually get things done, it, it comes from gauging and listening, not only to your constituents, but to other people in the arena with you to find a path forward. Governor Nixon, thank you for joining us and thank you for sitting down with us for all those hours the last couple yeah. weeks. And uh, everybody can turn to tune right now at the end of the show to MissouriTimes.com, the first of a four-part series. It will go out through Wednesday, kind of covering the entire breadth of a very interesting 30 years in politics. And we'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. Representative Tracy McCreary on the show after this. In 2008, Republic Services acquired the Bridgeton Landfill in a merger. Since then, we've invested $200 million to clean up the site and to maintain environmental compliance. We do that while staffing the facility 24-7. That's because we support permanent solutions that are safe for our neighbors and clean up the environment. We're committed to doing what's right. That's what drives us every day. We're a part of the community, and we are here for the long haul. Republic Services. We'll handle it from here. My name is Eric Phillippe. I'm a veteran, a carpenter, and a father. When Eric Greiton said he was gonna change politics as usual, folks like me didn't think the first thing he'd do as governor was take dead aim at our jobs and our families' livelihoods by working to repeal prevailing wage. Call Governor Greitens. Tell him to protect prevailing wage and to protect my family, not destroy it. At Ameren, Missouri, we believe in the power of light. It makes scary stories less scary. And nighttime adventures, more likely to last the night. A bright enough light can illuminate opportunities to affect positive change, neighborhoods that need a helping hand, and the advancements needed to ensure tomorrow is a little cleaner than today. Transforming the future of our community by shining light in every direction. That's energy at work, Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to This Week in Missouri Politics, our opinion maker panel time. Representative Robert Corneo, St. Charles County, just graced by a visit from the President of the United States. Welcome Absolutely. to the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Uh, David Barkley, Dean of the Republican Party. Welcome back, sir. Thanks, sir. Representative Tracy McCreary, friend of the show. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Jack Cardetti, the favorite son of uh, St. James, Missouri. Welcome to the show, sir. I think my Trump invite got lost this week. Mm. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> uh, I bet you, I'll bet you Trump does well in St. James, you know. <laughs> It would have um, been roughed up if you tried to get through that line. We just had a guy that I met when you worked for him on the show, Governor Nixon. It was one of the most enjoyable things I've done in a long time, getting to interview him over six, eight hours, go his whole career. 
now that a year has passed, what will be the legacy of Governor Jay Nixon? Yeah, I think this morning when we woke up, um, there were workers at the Ford plant in Kansas City yep. that have a job directly because of him. There are people down in Joplin that have rebuilt their lives directly because of his work. And I think what it really shows is when you have a governor who really wants to do that job and all he cares about every day, you won't always agree with him, is getting up and working for the people of Missouri, what kind of difference he can make in people's lives. I was in McGreery, um, Jay Nixon, there, there are folks inside the Democratic Party who thought maybe he's too conservative, this or that. Mm -hmm. He got the most votes of anyone in the history of the state for governor. Um, I think history will be kind to Jay Nixon. I agree. When he took over as governor in 2009, the economy was in shambles. And under his leadership, he did all kinds of things to help keep the budget balanced and sensible. And also, under his leadership, Missouri was number one in that we were able to freeze tuition rate increases for college. So that's a huge deal. And I think families really appreciate his leadership. Robert Cornell, you served in the legislature while he was governor. Um, yeah. Looking back now, I'll get a little perspective on it. How do you think history will view Governor Nixon? Yeah, you know, I think pretty kindly, you know, he's in all eight years we passed a balanced budget without increasing a single tax. Um, you know, I worked with him in his office was on Senate Bill 5 back in 2015, which I think 20, 30 years from now is going to be looked upon as a very transformative piece of legislation that uh, completely shifted the way municipalities look at sure. as citizens, as an ATM. David Barkledge, uh, I'm sure you'll tell folks you never said a bad word about Jay Nixon, but uh, you were somebody on the other side of, uh, of a lot of those fights from Jay Nixon. Uh, but looking back, how will history remember his time in office? Well, I, I think a couple ways. One, I, I describe him as sort of a dodo birdie. He's the last of his kind, uh, an extinct yeah. Democrat, an anti-tax Democrat. Um, he, I think, managed well in the crisis, uh, extremely well. Uh, he had some very good successes. I think there were some missed opportunities, partly because he was over a party that probably didn't want to go necessarily the way he wanted to go. And so those wouldn't be increasing spending and things like that. So you didn't see a lot of, I think, uh, you know, thoughtful, uh, innovative things out of his administration. But in terms of, of being Missouri-centric, and doing things for the University of Missouri, doing things for the people. I don't think there's any doubt that his heart was always with the state, always yep. with uh, wanting to, to, to put the state first. I think that is, in my opinion, from some on the Republican side, his true legacy, that he was really very Missouri-centric and very care, much cared about the state. Jack Ernie, there's people that disagree with Jay Nixon on a lot of things. Even in that interview, he mentioned tax cuts, and there's, there's a lot of fights. I don't know that there's anybody, even his opponents, would question he really cared about the state of Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a reason that he was elected to governor twice by double digits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in this day and age, when you look at the political environment, that's really hard to get that many people bought into what you're wanting to do for the state. And so I think he was able to do that, you know, and I think as a result, he, we really, he got into office at a time where we really needed him. If you look back at that recession, 2009, the budget and the economy was in collapse, and he really had to work each and every day to, to, to work us through that, and I think we're better for it. Can I say one thing yeah. is that from a political standpoint, he did a ton for the Republican Party, and not being, you know, uh, uh, cute about it, but his lack of engagement for Democrats really allowed the Republicans in the last eight years during Obama to grow and really to prosper. Uh, and he got a lot of criticism in the party from that. At the same time, I think his own party should deserve the criticism, but they didn't find Democrats that more reflected him that were probably going to be more like uh, more likable and more electable in rural Missouri. So I don't think the full blame is on him, but clearly his lack of engagement for the but party David, allowed didn't us to that grow. that happen to Democrats all over the Midwest yeah. during the Obama administration? Yeah. But, but he gave them a pattern. He, well, he showed them a way and they ignored it. Mean, Tra Tracy, there was all over the country, in 10 and 14 especially, Democrats were wiped out of state offices they'd had majorities in or, or substantive minorities in forever. Why would Missouri have been different? What, I don't know that he could have stemmed the tide that hit the entire country. I, I agree. I, I think that it was a tide that hit the whole nation and we can't put any of the blame on Governor Nixon. Robert Cordell, you, you're with HRCZ, you've seen these races, you know these cycles. When it's your cycle and it's going to be a good year, it's going to be a good year, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, all those swing districts, you know, there are coattails all the way from the president to the yeah. governor, all the way down through your state rep races to the local courthouses. And, you know, some people at the top of the ticket, you know, have coattails that, that you can jump on. So uh, we're taping the show this morning, Representative, uh, on Friday. Uh, let's assume the outcome is at some point the commissioner of education is fired. Yes. Uh, what if, what does that actually mean to somebody who's got their kid in school tomorrow at 8 a.m.? Well, I, I'm just 
not surprised that a Navy SEAL thinks these 11th hour attacks are the way to do things, but I think they're really sneaky. It, it does not work for democracy. These backroom deals do not work. They do nothing to help students or teachers or our communities. So I'm just really, really disappointed ab about what the governor is trying to do with the State Board of Education. Jack Gordetti, should not the governor, who will be judged on how these schools perform, have his own person that he wants to be, at, to be in the job and then be judged on his people? No, I think there ought to be a layer between politics and our public schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is probably one of the biggest missteps Governor Greitens has made. I mean, this the, the, the problem when you go in and you try to fire the DESE superintendent that's brought Missouri into the top 10 in graduation rates, and, and you fail to do it, and you look really bad doing it. I mean, there's an old saying where I'm from, if you're going to shoot the bear, you better kill the bear. Mm -hmm. And he was unable to do that here. And what that does, it's put a red light. Every superintendent in this school, every elected school board member out there now is, is wondering why is Governor Greitens doing this? Is he doing it because he wants to consolidate rural schools? Is he mm -hmm. doing it because he wants uh, vouchers? What's he doing? It's going to put everyone in the public education on high alert, and that's politically problematic. Mm -hmm. David Barkley did just playing his two flag stores in St. James that this has been ugly and sloppy. It is. And... I feel sorry we have a good mutual friend, Eddie Justice, in the middle of all this. Great person. Uh, would love to see him get a full nomination and serve on the board. I don't know if that's going to be possible. I don't know if any of these people are going to be put on. I think there is a real question over the process of here. And again, I, among Republicans, and I think Robert and I know we all agree, is that we like the end game different than maybe Tracy or, or Jack would feel. But I think how it's being done is messy, divisive, sloppy, and it's really taken away from what should be the core interest, and that's the students. Mm -hmm. Representative, I, I think there's a part loss in this. These are good people. I mean, you know, Mr. Russell is a, is a very good guy. There's a legitimate case to be made for vouchers in school choice, right? And that's kind of getting lost in this. Absolutely, you know, and that, that's something that I think, as Mr. Barkledge stated, that at the end of this, the end game, he's going to get his people in there that he wants one way or another. There's six it may, million Missourians. It may, At some point, he'll find five to go along, right? Yeah, you know, it may take this weekend. It may take a few months. It may take till next summer. But eventually, his people are going to get on there, and, and we're going to move to allowing, you know, more local control, letting the most local control is letting parents decide what, what's best for their children. Why don't you just children. pass that with the people's duly elected representatives in the General Assembly? What, what's that? The, if you want to do a voucher system, a school choice system, why don't, why don't you pass those things to the legislature? That, that's a good question. You know, that's something that we've had a debate and discussion for, for many years now. And we've the ball, I think, has gotten further down the field each year. Would the state be better served if you're going to move from that independent layer to people that just do what the governor says? Are you not better served if they just have a secretary of education that reports direct to the governor? That's understandable. But, you know, I think to, to say that this is a separate independent board, I think, is, is complete nonsense. If you look at you know, these people are selected by the governor. They go through, eventually they're going to go through a Senate confirmation. At some point, politics is part of this, that, that, of who gets on this board. So I mean, that's kind of be, a red herring. So we'll, it, the, the people on the board say they're independent. They're not. They're doing this because they believe in this agenda. And I, and I take them at their word. However, if you go hire the guy that was flown in from out of state a few weeks ago, no, you're taking orders, right? I mean, that's how you tell that, that really the orders are being given and taken. Yeah, and, and look, I, my only disagreement would be, and I agree with you on that, is that <clears throat> the board is set up to sort of, I think, inoculate student policy and education policy from sort of the whim politics, uh, really for the children. And I think this board, it's important that it keeps its independence <clears throat> enough <clears throat> that it slows down and sort of looks at things. I, I think there was a better path, and that would have been to demand that the current commissioner look at the policies that this governor wants and if she failed to implement those or failed to implement them on behalf of the new board members he appointed that at that point she should have gone i'm not quite sure that this rush around a personality bringing someone else in was the right way to go representative speaking of boards and commissions there was another board the mhdc board that some guy got stuck on a few minutes before the meeting uh they pretty much gutted the state's uh LITEC program for housing developments kind of go from the Nice things you see like in downtown Poplar Bluff at the Vine Street Apartments to more just now urban with the federal only. Big win for the cities, but I mean, how long can you go on just having a St. Louis governor grab all that money just for St. Louis and Kansas City? Well, we, we have a growing need for affordable housing, for low-income housing, and we use a lot of acronyms in state government. This, the, this is the program that we have to help low-income veterans and seniors and people with disabilities, and I think that's gotten lost in all of this. It's just amazing to me. Again, it like it's hard to keep this DESI mess away from the 
this low income housing mess, they're very similar, backroom deals, and voters do not want to see that happen. And why eliminate a program? We could, let's talk about reform. There are plenty of very um, reasonable ways we could reform the low income program. Robert Cornell, even in the House, though, just eliminating things from the governor's office, there's a legislature that had passed these and, and had set these programs up. Is this not something that should go through the legislature? Absolutely. You know, that's one thing that I'm absolutely upset about is that this, you know, supposedly another independent body is, is trying to act unilaterally that, you know, this is something that, you know, they are setting policy by completely zeroing out. And that's something that the legislature should do. And, you know, it's, it's something that's definitely going to be talked about this upcoming legislative session. You have a Republican that got elected with huge majorities in outstate Missouri, St. Louis governor, showing the outstate Missouri, we're very willing to, to, to vote for a governor from the urban areas. However, boy, I mean, I don't, I don't know how they'd like it in Sedalia when they find out what happened to them. Look, the, the approach that has been taken is, a, is an approach that's going to fail long term and it's going to be very disruptive. That there need to be reforms in the tax system. I, I think there's very few people that agree that there's not things in Litex, there's not things in, sure. in EcoDevo and Historics that we can't change to make more efficient in the times that, that dollars are precious and getting services to people. But I think this unilateral approach and not building support, not building an understanding of policy is bad governance. Jack, does the state senate just continue to get these thumbs right in the eye? Or is there January 3rd at noon maybe coming and there's an old gunslinger from Joplin. You can humiliate his constituents, you can not call him, you can stick your thumb in the tradition of the state, but I tend to think Ron Richard, when he gets to town on January 3rd, is probably not going to take it lying down. Yeah, I think Ron Richard may actually give us a little constitutional education. <laughs> there, <laughs> you know, there are actually three branches of Missouri government, really? you know, and, and, and so, I, you know, call me old fashioned. I'm used to when a governor or an executive wanted to make change, real change in the state, they would stand up and they'd say, this is the problems, here's the solutions, here are the things we need to do to change, for instance, mm -hmm. a low income housing program. And this is gonna be more efficient for the people of Missouri, It'll deliver a better service at an efficient cost of your tax dollars, right? And they would make that persuasive argument. They'd pull together a coalition. They would convince legislators, a super majority here for Governor Greitens, to make those changes. Why he's unwilling and unable to do that is really surprising. And I think come January 3rd, that probably comes back to bite him. But, but I'll tell you this, every governor makes mistakes at some point in their term. I think this is that period for him. We can't. He's smart. He makes corrections. He's disciplined. We can't but. make the mistake going over. So with a minute left, who won the week? Uh, St. Charles County, you know, hosting the president this week in St. Charles Convention Center. And, uh, you know, great place to live. It's one of the fastest growing counties in the state. And who doesn't want to be there? Who won the week? <laughs> County executive candidate over here. No. <laughs> uh, I think Tony Messenger in the, in the post. I think, again, they're showing again and again their ability to drive news, Absolutely. to make news, and to report news, which we're seeing disappear at all levels. You're seeing a, a new crop of messenger Republicans in the legislature and the governor's office. I think Missouri voters and Missouri workers won the week when the Secretary of State certified that so-called right to work referendum petition. One week? I think the University of Missouri did. It's no secret the University of Missouri the last couple of years has had a tough go of it. But they're really, with under the new president, the new leadership, they're starting to put things together. They, 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 have, a, they have an enrollment plan to increase that. I, I think that's a good thing for the state of Missouri and for the very University. good for the state. I'm gonna say Josh Hall had a good day. The president came to town, he was there, got very favorable words from him. I think the guy that got the most votes in the history of the state for president might help elect the senator. And we will be back next week with the full opinion maker panel on this week in Missouri politics. This week in Missouri politics brought to you by Spire and Sterling Bank.